that was a very nice introduction. Um, I also want to share a little bit with you about why I started doing this. I was a, a nurse working in an ICU, an intensive care unit, and seeing patients who were very, very sick. Um, and many of them died. And, and I thought, you know, there's something that I want to do. I want to help prevent them from getting to the ICU, getting to the ER. What, what, what's going on? What can we do different? So I went back to school, and I decided I was going to work in family medicine, and I was going to just save the world. And then unfortunately, my patients were getting sicker. Their diabetes got worse. Their high blood pressure got worse. Their weight went up. And they're, they're following everything I'm teaching them, the, the food pyramid, the My Healthy Plate. They're doing it all perfectly. They're just I'm doing everything you tell me. And I'm like, well, oh, something's not making sense. And it, it led me to research and find that, you know, there is, there is another way. And, and that's really what I want to do for you today is share with you some history that I came upon, finding that there is a way to help people through nutrition to achieve those health and wellness goals. We're going to review the history a little bit, discuss the relationship of insulin and weight gain, explain sugar a little bit and its cravings, and propose a new lifestyle that Dr. Westman and Dr. Klein will get into in more detail. This is a plan that's endorsed by the Obesity Medical Association. The Department of Defense and the Navy SEALs use this plan. The Department of Defense also pays me to travel and teach this plan to our military, which is really quite exciting. Similar plans are taught at Fit Camp, um, at Camp Dawson, which is a program to help the military and currently taught at Duke, the Cleveland Clinic, the Mayo Clinic, and a few other places. This is an amazing statistic, and I really want that to sink into you for a moment. 70% of us struggle in some capacity with weight. 70%? Wow. That's, that's a, a large statistic, and what's going on? Why is that the case? What's happening? This didn't used to be the case in our country. So we can bore you to tears with the definition of what obesity is, but, but know that it's extensive. There's many, many factors. Eat less, move more isn't, isn't the answer. An interesting little slide I like, it, it features the 1980s data from CDC on the number of folks that struggled with weight. And then you come over here, 2015, and look at how those numbers have skyrocketed. Even Virginia, West Virginia being quite dark. So for, for thousands of years, man has survived as hunters and gatherers. For only a fraction of that time has there been modern agriculture. Sweet foods to our Paleolithic ancestors, they would, they would stumble upon this once or twice a year, but that let them know that it was safe to eat. And I love that about 400 BC, Aristotle even commented that people that were eating too many figs started to get tooth decay. So even in 400 BC, they started to notice something's going on. So up until about 150 years ago, sugar wasn't even part of our regular diet. So we've been really only eating even refined carbohydrates for about 100 years. 1670 approximately is when there was this big influx into England they started bringing in from the Caribbean these, the sugar. So, um, and even, we could go into great detail, but, but the neat little statistic, I kind of have a thing, I guess, about teeth, but Queen Elizabeth, <laughs> um, many people know it when they come to visit her, come to visit the English, they all started to have rotten teeth. Queen Elizabeth was known to have black teeth. She loved some sweet tea. <laughs> so, 1825, um, and the physiology of taste was written. And they're talking about, hey, maybe it has something to do with flour and starch. 1863, Dr. Banting was an undertaker. He published a, a letter that many people know as, as the letter of corpulence. And in many countries, they bant after Dr. Banting. And in South Africa, I think they have banting aisles down the grocery store and banting cookbooks. But it's a story about how he lost 50 pounds, eliminating certain items from his foods. And he really got some of these ideas from the French. The sun just became standard health advice. If you wanted to be healthier, you limit some of these sweet things. A little American history, Lewis and Clark. 40 deer, three buffalo, 16 elk were a disappointment. That was not good enough because they were too lean. They really desired more animal fat. So I kind of think that's quite a big hunt, and it wasn't quite enough. 
1890s to 1900, here, Native Americans were steady. They ate buffalo. They, they had little teepees. They followed the buffalo wherever they went. Um, they ate mostly animals. And they really had a big absence of disease. And you can see this. This goes as a trend throughout history. 1900s, the Inuit societies in the, in the Arctic were steady. They ate 70 to 80 percent of their nutrition derived from animal fat. They would like look for the little fat pieces behind the eyeball of the caribou and, and other things. And if you want to read more about that, there's a book called uh, Not by Bread Alone, written in 1946, about how Ophelia lived with the Inuit and what he observed from them. Again, they had very little disease. 1919, prohibition. So now, it's not legal to drink. What are we going to do? Sugar's legal. So then by 1920, the U.S. sugar consumption hit a record high. All the breweries converted to candy factories. Yay, right? Alcoholics Anonymous, their big book, even recommends that if you want to help with your coping, with your addiction, you're going to consume candy because it satisfies those same receptors in the brain. So the 1930s, um, the Great Depression, candy consumption was depression proof, they found out. For those that could afford it, they were still buying candy. So some argue, you know, hey, you're following the stock market. Whenever, you know, economy, you know, tends to turn, hey, invest in things that people are going to want their fix. 1935, refrigerators were available and affordable. 1.5 million were sold that year. So now people could put ice cream soft drinks in their home. You didn't have to go to the to the soda jerk to get any of that anymore. It's now available in your home, available whenever you want it. That's, that didn't used to happen, right? So then we entered into World War II, soft drink sales went from 200 million to 750 million cases. 1942, sugar rationing from other countries. So that we saw a small little dip there, but our U.S. molasses, again, I think it's kind of a neat thing, was used to make industrial alcohol for synthetic rubber explosives. That's kind of neat. We did that with molasses. So 1945, then the sugar started being diverted to the U.S. Army. So we diverted that because it was used as a stimulant. And we're going to talk to you a little bit about a guy named Keyes, and he was kind of instrumental in us doing this. Coca-Cola and Pepsi even wanted the military, you know, in on this. Here, we're going to give you, who cares how much it costs us to make this Coca-Cola and the Pepsi? We want to give it to you for five cents. 1940s, 1950s, soft drink, ice cream, candies, they all hit these record highs. The neat thing about Minute Maid came about really because of prohibition. All these grape growers couldn't make wine anymore. What are they going to do with their crop? We're going to turn it into juice. And it's going to be part of the American breakfast. Sugar for breakfast. 1950s breakfast cereals came. Look, if you want manpower, you're going to eat cereal. Right? You want to be a man? Have some cereal. <laughs> it's not what we think. <laughs> so 1944, this is the Ansel Keys fellow that I was telling you about. He's known mostly for the K rations. And, um, some people don't realize, and you can see it a couple bullets down, he was funded by the Sugar Association. Some would consider that unethical. <laughs> but these K rations are mostly sugar. And like, here we're just going to load up the military and all this sugar and rev them up and give them tons of energy. Not to mention they might crash, but here's some more. So, 1948, the American Heart Association received $17 million from Procter and Gamble. So thus things become a little political and sticky, and there's now private funds funding organizations that govern how we recommend how we should eat. 1952's Ansel Keys denied that cholesterol had anything to do with heart disease. By late 52, he was now funded by the Sugar Inst Institute's or the Sugar Association. He would implicate fat in that club. I mean, he was force feeding volunteers tons of cholesterol, and their blood cholesterol levels never rose. Over 3,000 milligrams a day of cholesterol, and their blood cholesterol was unaffected. But now, now we're just going to say, hey, 
There's no randomized controlled trials or studies, just a theory that, that fat is bad. And when questioned, he was questioned, there was numerous criticism, and he really couldn't give a good answer. 1953, we get the Battle of the Bulge. Now everybody's starting to die. This was due it, from the early 1800s to, to post-war, there was suddenly this 700% increase in heart disease. 700% increase in heart disease? What? What's happening? Bread and sugar rations were gone. There's now this influx of TV dinners, McDonald's, tobacco. And for those of you that don't know, the federal government broke with the tobacco trust in 1913. Camels came out of that. And they said, you know, we're going to flu cure the leaves. We're going to change your sugar content from 5% to 20%. And now we're going to blend it with a chew tobacco, which has molasses and maple syrup, giving it its sweetness and its flavor. So then by 1915, we see it, an influx in lung cancer. Sugar's the root cause, not the tobacco. Eisenhower even, interesting enough, he had almost seven heart attacks in the White House. He was really part of this post-war push for low fat, and he had pictures taken with, you know, sweet and low and all sorts of things. He was a four-pack-a-day smoker. That's a lot of cigarettes. And he really helped push this low fat. He was you know, Ansel Keys, I think they were all related, working together, pushing the low fat agenda. Nutritional guidelines change, information was lost, but again, we're not gonna get into that. I think that's kind of an interesting one though. More doctors smoke animals. There was a problem. And two, I mean, it was really encouraged in healthcare. Like even if you were you were pregnant, you don't you don't want a big baby. Just just have a couple cigarettes a day. Keep that baby small. I mean that was common advice. It sounds silly, but that's the kind of thing that was given. In 1977, the U.S. Senate Committee deliberated that fat was the cause. They met for about eight hours. I think it was a McGovern campaign. And they met for eight hours to say, hey, we're going to come up with a food pyramid. In eight hours? We're going to make something up with no appropriate research? Then American fat consumption dropped. They're 30%. Wow. It's the first time that we now had government guidelines on how we should be eating. I like that. It's a good kind of fat. So it's confusing. So now we hear things. Eat this. Don't eat that. Do this. Don't do that. And, and, and it's, you've got Jenny Craig's and Wade Twelfthers and all these different companies and things. And, it's, and we've got a lot going on. And we are confused. So cholesterol's bad. Now it's good. What do I do? So I want to talk to you a little bit about the macronutrients. Protein and carbohydrates are about four out per gram. Fat is more, right? But let's think about this. If you have a gallon of gasoline and a gallon of motor oil, are they equal? They're measured the same, but in the car they're burned differently, used differently, stored differently. They're going to behave differently in the car. So in your body, you can have a calorie of fat, a calorie of carb, a calorie of protein, and they're burned differently, used differently, stored differently on a molecular level. So it truly matters the quality of the calorie, not the quantity. Because if it was about the quantity, everybody who ever had the gastric bypass to make their stomach this big would be this big around. And that's not the case. It's the quality of the foods that we're consuming. So no, they're not necessarily equal. I'd like to touch a little bit on the glycemic index. and It's an index that ranks food um, on a scale of 100. IV sugar is about 100. So IV sugar, 100, and then let's say, some of you have heard this before, whole wheat, white bread, Snickers, blended sugar. Of those items, depending on the glycemic resource, you find Splenda can be ranked up as high as an 80 next to the IV sugar. Whole wheat, 72. White bread, 61. Sugar, 70. Snickers, 41. Two slices of whole wheat bread can raise your blood sugar more than a Snickers candy bar. So I like this because we love sugar. We have a little sweet tooth. I think that's rather cute. So it's kind of interesting to see animals that prefer sugar and animals that don't. I just thought it was kind of a fun slide. 2,000 individuals consumed over 150 pounds of sugar that year. That's a lot. Most of it from corn syrup. 
Half of a person's diet could be derived from glucose or fructose. Sugar is a big driver of diabetes, obesity, and many other inflammatory disorders. So I like to explain this. It's one of my own little cartoons. When you eat, or even stressed, your blood sugar is going to go up. And when your blood sugar is elevated, insulin comes out and it's going to drop your blood sugar. How do you feel when your blood sugar is really low? You're tired. You're hungry. You're worn out, right? So what are we going to We're going to eat again or have the Starbucks, the coffee, the snack, the pick-me-up. And then we drop. And then you're going to eat. And then you're going to drop. And you're just on this roller coaster of life saying, I'm tired all the time. I'm worn out. But let's explain how that works a little bit. Insulin, and again, it's very simplified here. Oversimplified. It's much more complicated. But for the sake of teaching, this key is insulin, right? It's going to open the door to the cell and allow these glucose molecules in. Your body's only allowed 1 to 1.5 teaspoons of sugar in your bloodstream at any given time. That's not a lot, folks. 1 to 1.5 teaspoons. So insulin's going to come out in response to that elevation. It's going to bring these glucose molecules into the cell. But on the American diet, this cell's full. This cell's saturated. There's no room in the end. But our body likes homeostasis, so it has a backup plan. And the backup plan is going to take it over here to this liver and repackage it. And it's going to give you fatty liver, high cholesterol, or store on our tummies, waist, hips, and thighs, our favorite places, right? Insulin's behind a lot of this. Insulin's a hormone. How do we manipulate this? We can manipulate it by manipulating your carbohydrate. When insulin is secreted, a chronically elevated fat <coughs> accumulates. Thus, weight gain. When insulin levels drop, fat will escape. Let's lower our insulin. When we secrete insulin, primarily for the response of carbohydrates, it can also respond to the, uh, when we eat protein. Fat doesn't create an insulin response. Insulin's the devil, okay? He's here to make you tired, hungry, worn out, weight gain. And I love this photo here, and I have to credit Dr. Westman for having me read the book. It's Eat, Bake, and Don't Jog. And I think Dr. Westman cited in the book, but it's a cute little picture. <laughs> So, what triggers insulin? Refined carbohydrates, grains, and sugars, carbs. It blocks our satiety hormone that left in frequent meals and snacks. If I had little Fido here and I fed my dog every two hours, would I amplify his weight loss? No. It doesn't work that way, folks. And other countries don't teach that. Cortisol. Right? Nobody's stressed. It's just rainbows and sunshine for us all every day. We, we are a stressed out culture. Run, 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 go, 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 do kids and sports and activities and laundry and dinner. All that cortisol isn't good for us. Sleep. If you're not sleeping, you could be storing artificial sugars. That's, you know, it's, it's a touchy subject. Yes, you can have some, be mindful of it here and there, and there's some better options versus others. But if you're doing an abundance of those things, we've seen that inhibit success. Protein in excess can be an issue for some folks. How do you avoid something with so many names? And this list probably isn't all inclusive. Wow. Corn is candy. Be mindful. Many years ago, corn was very tiny. It would have seven or eight kernels. What we see now goes in and comes out the same way. <laughs> you know? Don't pretend you don't know. <laughs> so, you only get sugar from it. No vitamins or nutrients. Okay. This is a natural banana and an artificial dessert banana. Our food's been fooled with. Yes, what would be great is if we all go and live on a farm and raise everything yourself and grow all your own vegetables and be perfect, and I've yet to meet that perfect person. That's not going to happen. We're going to open and sort of remove the blinders, let you see what's been there the whole time, and say, you know what? Make smart choices. You can't be perfect in all of this. Just make the best decisions in your given situation. You know, I've recently worked with a fellow who um, is a long-haul truck driver, and he eats three meals a day at a gas station. Is that ideal? Absolutely not. 
but by learning to make smarter choices in his given situation and his environment, because he can't quit his job, you know? So, so he's now down 50 pounds in five months, eating at a gas station. So it is possible. Sugar makes us happy, right? You see that hot sign on the Krispy Kreme donut place? Watch one. <laughs> you go and you eat it. It's all warm and gooey. I wouldn't know. I've never done that. Um, they, there are some things that are triggered, you know? These triggers can cause us to want to, to have something to help us cope. You know, oh, I'm really stressed out. I just need, I just need that brownie to make me feel good. I just need that cookie. I just need an escape. I'm just trying to be, change how we feel. But, you know, that fleeting moment of pleasure won't fix the problem. Repeated exposures can wipe out our receptors, our dopamine receptors, causing you to need more and increase your appetite for your fix. The brain just sort of gets hijacked. Sugars and sweetened uh, refined carbohydrates have a sort of a drug effect on the brain. Sugars act on the same neurotransmitters as alcohol, morphine, heroin. You have a population in a constant state of withdrawal and craving and relapse. And what I think is interesting about this photo, this is a cocaine brain, right? This is a brain on sugar, and it's very similar. So I'm proposing, you know, hey, a little food pyramid, balancing things out, food pie rather. I think Dr. Westman and Dr. Klein are going to get into this further, so we'll just move on. But low carb, high fat is what some call a lifestyle we encourage. Modified Mediterranean, banting. Um, it has many, many different names. I just like to say, hey, we're going to limit sugars and starches in your diet. You give something a crazy name and it sounds scary. Just limit your sugars and your starches. So ketosis um, in a metabolic state, which the body you know, uses ketones in the blood, um, to con in contrast to the same blood calcium. So fat is used as fuel. This is the meal. I, had, I didn't eat these goodies, but I had my eggs. <laughs> That's good stuff. And I think it was at one of those events out in California. Health and benefits of this type of a lifestyle. Weight loss, fat loss, energy, diabetes, heart disease um, improvement, lower blood pressure, cancer therapy, epilepsy management, inflammation, enhancing sleep. Specific foods, it kind of gives you just a quick little food pyramid here. Again, I don't want to spend too much time on that. Um, salt is important, and again, we might get into that a little later. I like to talk a little bit about making sure our tummy's okay and our germs are all right. Um, and we talk a little bit about fasting sometimes. This is a neat little slide about uh, cholesterol of a patient that I had. His triglycerides were well over 2,000. And he'd been rather high for quite some time. And at this point, his wife brought him in and said, you know what, he's, he's at risk for pancreatitis. The doctor wants to admit him. Um, he's 40 years old, maybe 10 pounds overweight. And he never had a triglyceride level below 500. Within three weeks, and I know this is hard to see the date, within three weeks of transitioning, and eating some bacon and butter, we were able to drop this cereal oatmeal eating fella from 2,000 to 167 in three weeks. Um, and, and, and to this day, this was in 2014, to this day, he's still off all of his medicine. He's on three cholesterol pills. Three cholesterol pills, and his triglycerides were still 2,000. Just some folks, some of their you know, shots as they're making progress. I love this gal, 47 pounds in four months, postmenopausal. Another gal, making great success, 70 pounds in seven months, a couple of making progress. This gal, I think, is even here today. Um, I don't want to embarrass her, but she, um, it now, I think last I checked, was like 130 pounds in 13 months. So kudos to her. <laughs> She'll share her story, but she wanted to zip line. And finally, she's able to zip line. So some book recommendations I, I encourage um, and some references for you.